uh, very pleased uh, to welcome you all to the last meeting of our Center for Global Ethics and Politics um, colloquia for the year. And uh, before I introduce our speaker, I would just like to take uh, the occasion to thank a few people who have been helping us all along. In particular, John McMahon, who's our videographer and the assistant at the center, and he's done just a great job. And then we've had a wonderful group of, um, of RAs, one of whom is not right here this minute. That's so good. Sumeru um, Atuk is our, um, um, it's just out uh, checking on the food. But uh, she's done a great job, as has Phoebe Friesen and John Kwan over there. So thank you all for that. And also, I'd like to thank Hugo Greca for his help in um, sponsoring some of our activities. So, um, and Sybil Schwarzenbach will be um, uh, helping to direct the center, but the year after next, so there's... Oh, it's the year um, after? Yeah, oh, good. I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was beginning to see I was working too late. <laughs> yeah, okay, so anyway, today we have this incredible... Um, incredible distinguished speaker, Ian Shapiro, who is Sterling Professor of Political Science at Yale University, where he also serves as the Henry R. Luce Director of the Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies. He's written widely and influentially on democracy, justice, and the methods of social inquiry. A native of South Africa, he received his JD from the Yale Law School and his PhD from the Yale Political Science Department, where he's uh, taught since 1984 and served as chair from 1999 to 2004. Um, he's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society, as well as a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He's a past fellow of the Carnegie Corporation, the Guggenheim Foundation, and the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences, and has held visiting appointments at the University of Cape Town, at uh, Keio, is that how you say it? Yeah, more or less. University in Tokyo and Nuffield College, Oxford. His most recent books are The Real World of Democratic Theory, Containment, with the subtitle Rebuilding a Strategy Against Global Terror, The Flight from Reality in the Human Sciences, and Death by a Thousand Cuts, The Fight Over Taxing Inherited Wealth, with Michael Gratz. His current research concerns the relations between democracy and the distribution of income and wealth. And for us, he's going to be <laughs> presenting a paper entitled Democracy Against Republicanism. Thanks so much for coming. Well, great. Thanks for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and especially on such a nice day where I'm sure it would be more fun to be out in the park or something like that. But. Um, I'm talking about a book, a chapter of a book that I'm writing called Justice Against Domination. And it, the, the chapter in question is available, it's posted. Where is it posted? It's on the uh, our CGEP, our Center for Global Ethics and Politics website, which is, I meant to say that, http cgep.ws.gc.cuny.edu. There you go. Um, so, I'll say, I'll say a little bit about the book, and then I should talk for about 45 minutes, yes. is that the norm? And we'll have a discussion, and then a reception, as always. Okay. Um, so, the book is an argument uh, for the proposition that non-domination is the bedrock of justice, an idea of non-domination, um, and it's an exercise in what I call adaptive political theory, which is to say that um, I think that one of the one of the things that's unappealing about much political philosophy is it takes insufficiently uh, insufficient account of the adaptive character of the human condition. That people have a much better sense of what's unjust and what they're not in favor of than of what's just and what they are in favor of. Um, and part of the attraction of the concept of non-domination for me is that it it, it reflects that. Um, that adaptive uh, feature of the human condition. Um, the, the book itself is divided into three parts. The first part is about uh, the philosophy of non-domination, where uh, basically I have two agendas. I argue for the idea that non-domination is, is a 
a better animating principle of justice than the other going contenders, mostly uh, unpacked as theories of freedom of one sort or another and theories of equality of, of one sort or another or theories of impartiality of one sort or another. Uh, and then my other agenda in the first, those first the chapters in part one is to differentiate my account of non-domination from the others that are on offer by Michael Walzer, Quentin Skinner, Michel Foucault, Jürgen Habermas, and Philip Pettit. The, the middle third of the book, from which the chapter I'm going to talk about today is taken, is about non-domination in institutional arrangements. Uh, and that, the, that consists of three chapters, which are something of an extended conversation with Madison. Uh, in that I think Madison was partly right but importantly wrong on various particulars of institutional design. Um, and so it's a, my views, uh, there are sort of a, an adaptation, part, partly critique, partly adaptation, and partly uh, emendation of, of Madison's views in The Federalist. And then the third part of the book um, deals with non-domination across borders where I look at uh, resisting domination uh, between countries, as in international relations type settings, but also across borders within other countries, as in all the issues uh, arising with the responsibility to protect doctrine in the United Nations, uh, and so on, uh, as well as in the final chapter, the conundrums that arise about uh, promoting democratic institutions across borders and fostering uh, democratization. But the chapter today is, is uh, somewhat polemically entitled Democracy Against Republicanism, and this is the uh, chapter in which I sketch out the main political institutions that I think are required by this argument. Um, I would say that the, the basic dilemma the most fundamental dilemma of institutional design for democratic theory arises from the fact that power is a natural monopoly, but that democracy requires competition in order to be effective. And so I think most people who are engaged in institutional design questions are at some level wrestling with that tension. How do we have competitive control of something that's a natural monopoly? And that there are basically two, two fundamentally different answers to that. I'd say they're ideal types. Many actual institutions involve some combination of them, but I still think it's worth pulling them apart at least to look at them. Um, there is the Republican answer that go, date, dates back, in at least in American political theory, to the Federalists, although as we know from Pocock and others, it goes back way, way further. And that is the, the notion of separation of power. So as, as Madison puts it, that ambition must be made to counteract ambition. That you divide up the control of the monopoly among departments of government um, as a way of, of limiting the possibility of institutional domination. Uh, the alternative is basically the Schumpeterian tradition, which says give temporary control of the monopoly to somebody. So the Schumpeterian idea is alternating control of the power monopoly, alternating control of all the instruments of government. I think the, the Madisonian model is most fully realized in the contemporary US, although it differs in various ways from, from what he advocated. And I think that the Schumpeterian model is probably most closely instantiated today in the Westminster system in that um, you really now have a parliamentary system. It's basically unicameral. The House of Lords has no effective power, although there are people who would like to change that. Um, and there's no judicial review to speak of. There's some nibbling away around the edges by the EU. But basically, it comes about as close as you'll find anywhere in the contemporary world, I think, to an operating Schumpeterian system. Most systems are some hybrid of those two, and I'll, uh, we can talk about that in the in the um, discussion if people want to get into very applied question, I'm happy to do that. Um, what I do in the chapter is try to make the case for a version of the Schumpeterian argument 
and uh, this this sort of the, the general a, a general theme uh, of the a motivating theme of the whole book is that the, the turn to civic republicanism that's occupied so much attention over the the last several decades has been a giant mistake, uh, and has mostly contributed subtractions from knowledge. And we really need to move on uh, and uh, uh, think about questions of, of uh, institutional design and political theory uh, without the aid of uh, its its uh, miscues. Mis um, so part of it is, is critical, therefore, and I, I'll, I'm just going to very briefly mention, there's way too much in this chapter to present in this amount of time, so I thought what I'd rather do is sort of describe the principal claims in it, and then people can, can pounce on me for what, whichever ones they find most outrageous uh, or disconcerting, and then you can talk about them. But, um, so I'll just mention briefly on the critical side and then spend more time on the constructive side of what I think is good about Schumpeterianism. Uh, on the ambition, on the, the separation of powers idea, um, as, as Dahl mentioned very briefly but didn't elaborate on in his preface to Democratic Theory in 1956, it's long on rhetoric and short on mechanisms that would actually make it work. Um, and if you look at uh, the ways in which the separation of power system is actually operated, uh, sometimes there's jealous guarding of uh, institutional boundaries, and sometimes there isn't. And so we've seen, for example, uh, since, Ma since Madison's time, uh, a massive transfer of authority away from the legislature, which they thought was the most dangerous branch and had to be guarded most uh, to the executive, often with the aid of the courts, and we've seen uh, the enhancement of the power of the courts at the expense of the legislature, often with the aid of the executive branch, as Keith Whittington and others have argued in their books. Um, I think there, there are a lot of uh, good reasons for this, and a very interesting paper by John Fairjohn and uh, Rick Hills points out uh, something that I think a version of which Rousseau actually noticed a long time ago, but um, that if you think about the, the three, uh, the one, the few, and the many as they exist in, in the American institutional setting, um, there's no conflict of interest between the president protecting his or her uh, personal institutional interest and protecting the institution of the presidency. That's very different when you think about uh, 535 Congress people and senators where there may be all kinds of collective action problems that make it much more difficult for them to think about protecting the institution of Congress against other institutions uh, given that they have to get reelected in their districts. And so it's not surprising, therefore, that it's much harder for Congress to, to protect its turf than for the presidency. Um, the, there's a huge amount of discussion about courts, uh, whether independent courts are important for the protection for limiting the possibility of domination. Mill and Tocqueville worry greatly about the um, tyranny of the majority, but all the evidence from actual democratic and republican institutional systems is that the heavy lifting in protecting against domination is done by having democracy and adding courts and judicial review on top uh, doesn't get any measurable benefit on top of what you get by having democracy. Um, so that uh, the, the notion that unless you have judicial review and independent courts, you're going to have a tyranny of the majority isn't empirically supportable. A lot of the arguments for this view were made by uh, people who came of age during the era of the Warren Court, the, the, the Dworkins and the Tribes and the Bruce Ackermans and the Owen Fisses. Um, and I make the case that partly for that reason they were unable to see that it was a massive historical outlier and the, the court we have today and the Rehnquist Court before it and the Burger Court before it and the courts that existed before 
the Warren Court are much more typical of what you get from Supreme Courts. In the empirical literature, the courts generally don't stray very far from uh, public opinion, uh, I think, is, is what holds up. Uh, and particularly, as, as I'll say more about uh, shortly, in the American context, I think the court has actually been enormously destructive of, of democracy as an institution for preventing domination, particularly in the areas of redistricting and in the area of the role of money in politics. Um, so uh, the, the separation of powers, judicial review, uh, they don't uh, warrant the kind of uh, uh, deference that they get in the Republican philosophical tradition when you, look, when you turn up the empirical uh, lights on them. A lot of attention to deliberative institutions. Uh, I think in the in the Republican tradition, it's it's uh, almost obligatory to talk about the importance of deliberation. Much less attention to how you actually institutionalize deliberation. And the problem with trying to institutionalize deliberation is that um, the same institution, the same institutional mechanisms that encourage deliberation also encourage um, bargaining. Um, so if you, if you think about the sort of classic deliberative setting of, say, a jury that must reach unanimity, uh, the, the unanimity requirement is there in order to encourage people to talk until they all agree. Um, but of course, if most people want to go home and there's one recalcitrant crank, crank they can hold the whole process hostage for as long as they want. And so um, they, they, they can extract premiums in that sense. And, uh, so I argue that deliberative institutions should never be more than consultative and uh, should always be subordinate to majoritarian institutions. And that, so in the British context now, uh, for example, the impulse to, to democratize the House of Lords is a, is a very bad idea because uh, when the House of Lords lost all of its power in 1911, uh, it, it went from being a partisan institution to becoming a much more deliberative institution because there was nothing at stake. Uh, the, all the, the old drunk lords stopped going, and the people who showed up had, um, you know, interest in it specializing. There's a lot of cross bench activity and that sort of thing, and, and the people who went actually read the bills carefully that the people in the House of Commons voted on without reading and found problems and, and became genuine deliberators. But it was sort of like the, you know, the irony is it was about the closest you get in the real world to a Habermasian ideal speech situation because they didn't have any power. Um, since uh, the 19, early 1990s when they have um, they, got, they started reforming the House of Lords, and it, it, they, got, they, they got rid of almost all the hereditary peers and started uh, putting in life peers only. And they, um, there's been this move now to talk about an elected second chamber. So the Lords have been gaining legitimacy. They've also been starting to become increasingly partisan and try to assert themselves. And I think that that's a, it's a bad idea because bicameral systems, for reasons I'll get to in a minute, uh, interfere with Schumpeterian competition. So I'm not a big fa fan of actually trying to institutionalize deliberative institutions if they're going to have any power. Um, I won't say anything more. Uh, I'll just say that um, I'll say one other thing, and then I'll turn to the, the, the uh, positive argument for Schumpeterianism. Uh, another thing you see springing up in the literature from the Bruce Ackermans of this world and people like the Frank Gilbert is to argue that not only should we have separation of powers, but we should actually have more institutional branches created. So, you know, uh, we've had this, the, fa the, the fashion of the last decade, couple of decades, is, is independent banks, but um, you know, Bruce would like to see independent electoral commissions, independent uh, commissions of various experts, and so on. Uh, and that, for, for reasons I'll get to in a minute, just seems to be pushing in absolutely the wrong direction. 
it, it's like uh, taking you know a paraplegic who's in need of uh, spinal therapy and transplanting extra limbs onto the atrophy and torso. That really we want to be going the other way. So what is the other way? Um, the other way starts from from the proposition that the basic pro institutional problem of politics is to manage power. Um, it doesn't start, most importantly, from any version of the social contract metaphor, uh, any version of the notion that, that representatives in government are agents of principles who are voters. The, the whole, it, it's a very radical, I think Schumpeter was a very radical way of thinking about power. It, it doesn't worry about the principal agent problem in representation because he doesn't think uh, institutions are there to represent in the first place. Rather, they're there because of the inescapable need to manage power relations, and the question is, how do you do it? I mean, Schumpeter was an economist, and so his impulse was, his, I think, starting impulse was to say, uh, monopolies are bad in politics just as they're bad in economics. And you need some form of competitive um, managing of power relations. But the problem in politics is power is a natural monopoly. And so what do you do about that? How do you think about that? And um, he basically pursues an, a, mo a model, in, 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 of, of, it's obviously highly stylized, but you know, in the economy you have consumers, in, in the politics you have voters, in the economy you have firms, in the polity you have political parties. In the economy, firms are looking for profits. In politics, um, parties are looking for votes. In the economy, firms produce goods and services. In the polity, politicians produce legislation. In the economy, you have a kind of consumer sovereignty in the sense that if firms don't produce what consumers want, uh, somebody else will. That's the competitive control. In the polity as well, you have the, the notion that if, if a political party doesn't produce what the median voter uh, wants, some other political party will have an incentive to do it. So obviously, that assumes a huge amount of way. Uh, uh, from politics, and, uh, and uh, I think the Schumpeterian analogy eventually breaks down. Um, but before it breaks down, I think it gives us some important insights. I'll just mention uh, two ways in which it does break down. One is that in the in the economy, there is really a principle and an agent, uh, in the sense that if you think about the, the firm, the principles are the shareholders and the agents are the people running the firm. But there's no real analog of that in politics, or no good analog of that in politics, because um, the principal, after all, are not the voters of the firms, though they, parties, although they always claim to speak for all of the voters. You know, anyone running for office will say, the American people want, the American people want, but in reality, they only represent some sub, some, what Madison would have referred to as a faction. Um, so that you know, when when Romney says something as honest as he knows 47 percent at least will never vote for him, uh, it's it's a bit like crapping on the carpet because he's saying something that's true, uh, that you, you you know that he undermines the, the fiction that you have to maintain in order to run. But the but the so the the people are not the principal if, if you want to pursue this analogy. Um, so sometimes people say, well, maybe they're the party members or activists or, or um, um, primary voters. But there, uh, there are difficulties with all of those notions, and they tend to be um, ways of, of empowering extremists that um, I think are deleterious to the whole Schumpeterian um, mechanism. Uh, and I, if people want to know why, I can, I can go into that in more detail. Um, but so it breaks down there, and then of course it also breaks down in that in, if you have dualistic competition, two big parties, which I think is the best form of Schumpeterianism, that's a kind of oligopolistic competition um, because uh, two big parties excludes a lot of people. And so let me say a little bit about 
about why I think it's, it's nonetheless the best system, given that we're choosing among the available possibilities. Um, so the basic idea behind um, Schumpeterian competition is that you need a, a you want to have ultimately competition over what the government is actually going to do. Um, you want to have competition over what the government is actually going to do for two reasons. One is just the desirability of, of political officials being set, subject to a competitive sanction, sort of toss out the bombs periodically thing, kind of thinking. But the other is you don't want them competing over anything at all. You, you want a situation in which what they are actually arguing about is what, if elected, they're actually going to do. And so if you, for example, think about proportional representation, a lot of people say PR is much better than single member district systems. This is because in PR you get proliferation of parties. Single member district system, we know from both the empirical record and Duverger's law that you, if you provided some basic conditions are met, you get two big parties. Right? If you have PR, you get proliferation. And people say, well, that's more representative. The Greens can have their green representatives in Parliament, and the, the far right can have their ultra-nationalist representatives in Parliament, and everything in between. And so people feel like they have their representatives in the legislature. The difficulty with that notion is that it's more representative at the legislative stage, but not at the stage of forming governments, because in PR systems, it's, it's virtually never the case that anyone wins enough to form a government. And so you have coalition governments, and then uh, th there's a disconnect between what the government actually does and what uh, the people were advocating when they ran for office. Um, and even more so, you sometimes get uh, tiny parties in pivotal positions, as often happens in Israel, for example, where, with the extreme religious parties. Nobody can form a government without them, and so they can extract huge premiums from uh, becoming a sport in order for willingness to participate in the government. So to the extent you can care, care about representativeness at all, um, I. You know, my argument is that it, it, it matters more what the government's actually going to do, so it's better to have uh, the competition be over that. Um, so that's an argument for single member district systems with of the sort we get we have here or that they have in the UK um, because of, because Duverger will operate and you'll we'll get uh, two big parties. It only operates if the constituencies more or less reflect the population uh, as a whole. It doesn't work in India, for instance, when you have big regional variation. Um, but PR will always produce party proliferation. So I think that the, that that's why Schumpeterianism in, in the debate with, over electoral systems would lead you in the direction of single member district. Why would it? Why would, why is it better than um, the American institutional system? Um, because although we, we have single member district systems here, the institutional system operates at odds with them. So you have, you, first of all, you have presidentialism, so you can have divided party control, uh, you can have divided party control of the House and the Senate, and, and then you have situations where if nobody's accountable for what actually gets done, plenty of finger pointing, everybody can blame one another. Um, you get essentially diffuse competition in the American system. You get competition in all the difficult, over all the different institutions, not to mention <coughs> federalism. But what Schumpeter, Schumpeter, Schumpeterianism suggests what we should have is concentrated competition. All the competition, you, you know, that what that in in the British system as it's evolved, not as it was designed. So I, I think it was kind of blind, staggering luck for them. In, in some ways, but as it's evolved, the House of Commons is ground zero. It's where the decisions are actually made. The executive is dependent on its confidence. The second chamber has no power. There isn't really judicial review. So um, 
whoever controls the House of Commons actually makes the policy. And it's typically one party. And it's so they run on a platform, and it's the closest thing you're going to get. So ironically, even though I don't think the principal agent problem is much to worry about, because I think what we're really doing is looking for a system to manage power relations. Um, in fact, I think it does better on the principal agent uh, model than the going alternatives. Um, that whole system is messed up by other things in the U.S. as well, uh, particularly that we're starting to see more and more regional variation in the country with blue state, red state sorting. Secondly, the Supreme Court has connived in making most districts uncompetitive by blessing gerrymandering that's geared to dividing up states between Democrats and Republicans, gerrymandering that's designed to protect incumbents, so we have almost no competitive districts in the American political system and in supporting the creation of majority-minority districts um, for uh, ameliorating the effects of race. And I have a complicated view about how, how it would be better to handle that that I'll talk about if people are interested in it. But it's an example, um, it's an example of where the, 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 what the court has done is actually being deleterious from the standpoint of an operating libertarian democracy rather than facilitating it. The other big area um, that the court has been so destructive in starts in 1976 with Buckley versus Vallejo when the, the court makes a statement that money is speech. And you know, we've been hearing all about Citizens United and the decision this week, but it, it, you know, it's what it's all details once you make that identification of money and speech and the, the notion that people have a right to, uh, that the court should protect uh, to speak their just to uh, freedom of speech uh, one of the analogies in the original Buckley decision uh, that they put they put in a footnote I think part because they may be embarrassed by or some of them might have been was uh, they say, um, being told that uh, you're, you're free to speak, but that your, your, your uh, political expression uh, can be limited, is like being told you're free to drive as far as you want on the open road uh, on a single tank of gas. Uh, so, and that, that has led to this, this whole uh, series of decisions that have opened the floodgates for a lot of money and politics which greatly distort um, the base the un operation the underlying Schumpeterian mechanism um, because the, the more that money can play uh, the role can, you know can play in politics the more um, those who, who have a lot of it can can distort the outcome and you know money is not speech money is a megaphone uh, in, in the public square and in, in institutional settings, uh, the fact that we have so many veto players in the American system makes it easier uh, for people with resources to uh, hide in the weeds of the principal agent problems that arise within the institutional system, say between um, legislators and bureaucrats in regulating the financial sector. I have quite a long discussion of Dodd Frank uh, and all that in that connection. Um, so that the, the, the bottom line at the end of the day about money is that um, once you abandon the notion that the, that the political system is designed to regulate power and, and instead say that the political system uh, should be limited to the extent that it interferes with people's rights and you create institutions to enforce that, you can get uh, the sort of result that we've gotten in the U.S. And so um, I think it's, it's uh, the, the American institutional system is kind of an attractive nuisance and it's, it's really unfortunate that uh, our separation of power system, particularly judicial review, is being pushed so much onto new democracies, both by us and often by um, um, 
consultants and, and others who are giving advice on constitution writing, because I think it, it's fundamentally misguided. So maybe I'll stop there and we can open it up. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much.